On Tuesday, December 3rd, 1957, an event shook the town of Sycamore, Illinois like nothing it had ever felt before. There were snow flurries that night, exactly the kind that children begged to go outside and play in. That's what second graders Maria Riddolf and Kathy Sigmund did on that cold evening in the 1950s. Outside, they would encounter a man with bad intentions. A man who would ultimately ruin both girls' lives. This week on Out of the Past, the murder of Maria Riddolf. Maria Riddolf was born on March 12, 1950 to Michael and Francis Ivy Riddolf. She was a playful child who spent a lot of time outdoors. By the time she was in second grade, Maria had developed a tight friendship with her neighbor and classmate, Kathy Sigmund. Maria begged her parents to let her go outside and play with Kathy that fateful night. Her parents were concerned, but let her go. No, they weren't afraid she'd be kidnapped. They simply thought it might be too cold to play outside. They never imagined their daughter was in real danger. Maria's parents let her go outside where she met Kathy. They played one of their favorite games, Duck the Cars, which sounds kind of dangerous in itself. The game consisted of the two girls running around a pole on the corner of Center Cross Street and Archie Place. When cars came, they'd have to run and hide before the car's headlights could shine on them. The most evasive player was the winner. A car approached from the south and parked conspicuously near the girls, but they thought nothing of it. They were even comfortable when the man got out of his car and approached them. The fear of strangers that was instilled in Oz's children just didn't exist in 1957. In an interview years later, Kathy said that they didn't even notice the man until he began speaking to them. And even then, they weren't the slightest bit nervous or uncomfortable. He offered the girls piggyback rides, and Maria accepted. The man told the girls that his name was Johnny, and he was unmarried. He asked the girls if they liked dolls, and Maria replied with an enthusiastic yes. She ran back to her house to get her favorite doll to show Johnny, leaving Kathy alone with the man. Kathy never accepted one of Johnny's piggyback rides. Maria was only gone for a few minutes, and when she returned, Kathy and the man were just where she'd left them. Shortly afterward, Kathy complained about the cold and began walking home to get her mittens. She was only gone for a few moments, perhaps not even as long as it had taken Maria to get her doll. But when Kathy returned, the street was empty. Neither her best friend nor the strange man were anywhere to be seen. Kathy was confused. She wondered if maybe they had gone inside to warm up, so she approached the Rudolph residence and knocked. Maria's 11-year-old brother Chuck answered the door and told Kathy that Maria was still outside, probably hiding. Kathy walked around in the dark for a few more minutes. She looked around a bit more, but then returned to the Rudolph's doorstep. I can't find Maria, she told them. Chuck went outside and searched for a few minutes before the gravity of the situation sank in. He soon decided that it was time to tell his parents. The family searched for a while, but finally became scared enough to call the police. Before long, the entire community was out searching for Maria in this Johnny character. Police Lieutenant Patrick Soler told CBS, Imagine armed citizens walking the streets with shotguns and rifles and handguns tucked in their waistband knocking on your door. We need to search your home. There's a girl missing. They set up roadblocks on rural roads. They stopped every car, searched every trunk. That's right, he said armed citizens. The people of this community were so touched by the disappearance of this young girl that they decided to take things into their own hands. But even after extensive searching, they couldn't find Maria. They found a couple of witnesses who claimed to have heard a child scream around 7 p.m. And they found the doll Maria had retrieved to show Johnny between a fence and a garage on Center Cross Street. But Maria Ridolf herself was gone. The federal government thought this could be a case of a kidnapping in which the perpetrator had crossed state lines, so they came to Sycamore to help with the investigation. The feds put together what they thought was an accurate timeline, with Maria being abducted between 6.45 and 7 p.m. This correlated with the scream witnesses heard. Law enforcement took Kathy Sigmund into protective custody, 
saying that they were concerned she was in danger because the kidnapper might want to come back and finish the job. It's interesting how differently cops thought back then. Kidnappers don't usually return to a neighborhood they've worked in in order to snatch a victim's friends, even if one saw their face. Because Kathy was the only person who had seen Johnny's face, officials tried their hardest to get her to identify the culprit through mugshots of previous offenders. Kathy had to look at endless police lineups and thousands of pictures. She reportedly identified a man in one of the lineups as Johnny, but that man had only been in the lineup to fill it out. He was locked up in jail at the time of the kidnapping. Years later, Kathy said she never remembered picking anyone from a lineup at all. That much interrogation was a lot to ask of an eight-year-old whose best friend had just been abducted, and it must have been extremely stressful for her. Her eyewitness account did not provide any substantial leads in the days after the crime. What she did give the police, however, was a description. Johnny was a man in his early 20s with blonde hair, a slim chin, a gap in his teeth, and a high voice. This case was huge. It made headlines everywhere. Both President Eisenhower and J. Edgar Hoover took an interest in the case, so they scoured the town of Sycamore. With that much manpower, they searched everywhere. They didn't find her until five months later. On April 26th of 1958, the heavily decomposed body of a female child was found under a tree in Woodbine, Illinois, a hundred miles from where Maria went missing. The skeletal remains were clad in only an undershirt, a top shirt, and socks. They conclusively identified the remains as Maria Rudolph through dental records. An autopsy was conducted immediately, but there was little forensic scientists could do in 1958 on remains in that state of decomposition. They couldn't even determine a cause of death. The coroner, James Furlong, forbade any crime scene photographs to be taken because he feared pictures of Maria's decomposing body would be leaked to the press. So no photographs were taken, despite how useful they could be to future investigators. The FBI came into the situation frustrated. The night of the kidnapping, the crime scene had been trampled so much by searchers, it was no longer of any use to them. They had no forensic evidence. The only evidence they had was the eyewitness testimony of an eight-year-old. After Maria's body was found, the FBI backed out of the investigation, leaving it to the local police. Since she hadn't been taken across state lines, it was not a federal offense. Before leaving this case cold for decades, detectives investigated a man in town named John Tessier. They visited his home just days after the kidnapping, and John's parents provided him with an alibi for the evening. He had been on a trip to Rockford, Illinois, where he was enlisting in the armed forces. Law enforcement still asked John to come in and take a polygraph test. He cooperated and passed the test. The police accepted his alibi and his name dropped off the suspect list. They were satisfied that the Tessier family had cooperated to the best of their abilities. They had even provided searchers with flashlights the night Maria went missing. After Maria was buried, life went on for the Riddolfs and Kathy Sigmund. Every day was painful, but they made it through. And after some time passed, they stopped being the center of everyone's attention. Weeks became months, and months became years, and after a while, some people didn't even remember Maria's name anymore. Decades passed before a deathbed confession turned this case on its side. In 1994, the mother of John Tessier, one of the original suspects from the 50s, was near death. She told her daughter Janet that she didn't want to go to her grave with this burden on her chest. She grabbed her daughter's wrist and said, those two little girls, and one of them disappeared? John did it! John did it! And you have to tell someone! Janet Tessier decided she couldn't ignore her mother's deathbed wish. She didn't know why her mother suspected John and didn't ask. Presumably because all John's siblings grew up knowing that their mother often protected John from the consequences of his actions. His sister Jean even told CBS that she knew her mother had lied about John's original alibi to the FBI. 
As Janet looked into the case, she discovered that a file already existed on John. Detectives from the 1990s looked into it, but decided not to investigate the deathbed confession, as John had been excluded back in 1958. This caused the case to stand still for a good 10 years. In 2004, Janet decided to contact the Illinois State Police. They began to interview different members of the Tessier family, and dark secrets came pouring out. John's younger sister revealed that he had sexually abused her for years, a behavior he undoubtedly learned from their father, who had also abused her. This was something the whole family knew about, but didn't or couldn't stop. Law enforcement's suspicions grew, and they decided to see if their only eyewitness could identify John Tessier out of a lineup. They put several pictures of young men in the 1950s in a line to see if Kathy Sigmund, now Kathy Chapman, could identify him. Kathy picked John Tessier's picture out, claiming to be 100% sure that he was the Johnny who had taken Maria. But John Tessier was nowhere to be found. After some detective work, it was established that he was now living in the state of Washington under the name Jack McCulloch, his mother's maiden name. He had a wife and a stepdaughter, both of whom were shocked by the allegations. Police questioned McCulloch. When they brought up the kidnapping, he lost his cool. I did not kidnap that little girl. Look into my eyes. She was loved in the neighborhood. She was a little girl with big brown eyes, and she was sweet as could be. Hardly said a word to anybody, and everyone loved her. It's strange that he had so much to say about her appearance and her demeanor while he's trying to defend himself. That's alarming behavior. He seems obsessed with her, like he never stopped thinking about Maria. Ultimately, McCulloch attempted to pass blame onto someone else in town. When pressed about the inappropriate behavior with his siblings, he admitted to sex play with his sister, but never called it abuse. He simply claimed they were close. McCulloch's interrogation raised so much suspicion that he was charged with kidnapping and murder 54 years after the crime had been committed. Once the charges were pressed, other young girls began to come forward with stories of abuse. McCulloch was a police officer in the 1980s, Officer John Tessier. Some women accused him of taking advantage of his position of power and sexually abusing young runaways. Tessier was charged, but pleaded down to a misdemeanor and lost his job as a cop. He claims to this day that nothing ever happened. So we've established that John Tessier slash Jack McCulloch is not a great guy. He is, by all indications, a pedophile and a predator. But is he a murderer? The state lacked any evidence actually tying him to Maria Ridolph. Prosecutors wanted to get him out of the community any way they could, so they ended up charging him with the rape of his sister, as there was a legal loophole they could use to overlook the statute of limitations. The state pursued these charges, even though the victim asked them not to. She did not want to talk about the most painful day of her life publicly. McCulloch was not convicted of these charges, mostly because of the amount of time that had passed since the crime and the lack of any physical evidence. Despite the loss, state's attorney Clay Campbell went ahead and proceeded with the murder trial anyway. They exhumed Maria's body to try and find new evidence something that could tie McCulloch conclusively to the murder. But they found nothing. The only new evidence that came from the second autopsy was a possible cause of death. Marks on her collarbone suggested that she might have been stabbed in the throat. McCulloch fought the charges. His attorneys thought there was only a tiny chance he could be convicted. This case carried many of the same problems as his previous trial. In his defense, attorneys wanted to show the court that an investigator had claimed to have solved the crime in 1997, pinning it on a man named William Henry Redmond, a carney who had passed away in 1992. This man was a pedophile who had been accused of killing several girls over decades. But the judge did not allow other theories to be mentioned at trial. He also didn't allow them to enter documents from the investigation against Tessier in the 1950s. The documents were too old, and the people who wrote them weren't alive to confirm what they wrote. But surprisingly, the judge did allow the deathbed confession from Tessier's mother into evidence. Statements from third parties like this are not usually allowed in court, but this one was. They had that, 
They had Kathy's positive identification and a jailhouse snitch who claimed McCulloch had confessed to him. There was no DNA, no fingerprints, no physical evidence of any kind. He stood by his alibi, but his sister insisted it was a lie. On September 14th, 2012, the courthouse erupted when the judge read the verdict, I find the defendant guilty. People were ecstatic, shouting that Maria had finally gotten justice. But had she? Was Jack McCulloch slash John Tessier really guilty beyond a reasonable doubt? People certainly wanted him to be, so they were willing to overlook a lack of concrete evidence. McCulloch appealed the conviction, unsuccessfully at first. But as I've said, the case was weak. They had no forensics. He next filed a petition, acting as his own attorney to try to get his conviction overturned or set aside. This time, they sided with McCulloch, as they saw the flaws in the case. And they found old phone records that suggested that his alibi might have been true. Additionally, people criticized the lineup from which Kathy had picked Tessier's face, as his picture stood out conspicuously from all of the others. He was the only one not wearing a jacket. A new trial was ordered in 2016, but they ended up dismissing the charges, so technically, Maria's murder is colder than it's ever been. Even with all the legal proceedings, I still think all the evidence points to Jack McCulloch slash John Tessier as the culprit. I believe his sister's allegations about him, and I believe her when she said her mother lied about the alibi. I also don't believe there's any merit to the other theory in this case. William Henry Redmond was a dangerous pedophile, but the police had nothing tying him to Sycamore. John Tessier, on the other hand, lived very near the Ridolfs. He moved far away and changed his name, like a man running away from something. It eventually caught up with him, but he was slick enough to slip through the legal system once again. I'm going to post some footage of the McCulloch interrogation in the description box below. Let me know what you think. Is he lying? Did he kill Maria? Share your opinion in a comment. This is a case with many twists and turns, decades apart. Tessier's trial was bad and the evidence was weak. It was solved decades after it happened, then unsolved. If I was a juror, I would see a lot of reasonable doubt for Tessier. But despite the legal challenges, all evidence indicates that he is indeed the culprit. I don't think it's ethical to prosecute someone 50 plus years after a crime has been committed without something like DNA evidence. Too much time has passed for the defendant to receive a fair trial. With that being said, I think that Tessier committed this crime. That he was Johnny. That he was the person who stole Maria Rudolph's life and robbed her of all the experiences a person deserves. If you want to help children who are suffering due to circumstances similar to those we talk about on this channel, I recommend making a donation to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. They are always working hard to keep kids safe, and your contribution can make a difference. That's all for this week. Please give me a thumbs up and subscribe. I'll see you next time on Out of the Past.